abiotic disorders, um, or what I like to call this talk is when bad things happen to good tomatoes, because sometimes it feels like you're doing everything right, and you're harvesting, you're getting a good crop, good yield, they look, they look great, but then once in a while something goes wrong, and um, it happens. So I'm going to show you things that can go wrong. It doesn't mean they're, they're going to go wrong all the time. And I try not to scare people thinking they're going to get every one of these problems because you may not get them. You may just get one or two or whatever, and then consult with your extension people, figure out what it is and solve the problem. So this is a big prevention, the temperature control, uh, make sure it's working correctly. And the way you know that is with your high low thermometer, um, making sure all of your systems and your equipment work. And every morning when you go in there, look and see what the low was. And if you're trying to get 64 and it's actually 58, you have a problem. So you need to raise the set point on your thermostat until your, your, the low end of your high low shows that you're getting the temperature you actually want. And not always that accurate. Avoiding the overcrowding. I mentioned this earlier and overcrowding. Dr. McAvoy also touched on that. Overcrowding is not really good for the plants. In addition to costing more and causing higher uh, percent defects, overcrowding um, keeps uh, leaves overlapping other leaves. So you get moist, moist spots on the leaves that may not dry properly, even with horizontal airflow. And those areas are prone to disease infection. So let's not overcrowd so we, we can try to control some of these things in advance. Good water quality. We like good water quality when we drink it. Well, so do tomatoes. Uh, the water should be tested by your lab. There's probably a lab at UConn. I know there's one at the experiment station in New Haven because I've been there. I used to, I didn't mention, I used to be an inspector for the Connecticut Department of Agriculture and I brought hundreds or thousands of samples to them every year from all over Connecticut, from seed feed and fertilizer samples around the state. So um, get your water tested and the proper way to do it is to get a jug of water that had water in it, not milk. And then use or dump that water, rinse it with your water, so you're getting a nice clean sample of your water, and then dump that out and fill it with your water, the water you will be using in the greenhouse. Um, take the top on so it's nice and tight and get it to your water testing place. So it's a clean jug, not orange juice, not water, not, um, not soy milk or anything else. So um, get a good test and let them know what kind of test you want. You want to test for greenhouse tomatoes. Uh, I talked about tissue analysis and I won't repeat this, but um, very important, especially if you're a new grower, you might want to do it every, every week or two. Once you're established every two or three or four weeks, it's probably fine because you, you start to tune or calibrate your eye to, the, to what's going on in the plant. So you see something a little peculiar, you take a sample, send it in, look at the results, and then you'll start to uh, recognize some of these things, the nutritional effects. So you get your sample uh, analysis report back, and then you look at what's high and low make adjustments where needed. If, if uh, the stars are aligned, everything will be in the sufficiency range and it's a beautiful day. So maintaining your equipment, talked about that before too, heaters. In addition to making sure the heaters work before you need them, make sure they don't have exhaust gases leaking into the greenhouse. The tomatoes need the heat and they love carbon dioxide but any traces of carbon monoxide or ethylene are devastating to tomatoes. They're ultra sensitive. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But when you walk the house, make sure your uh, emitters are, are working. If you see a wilted plant, stop and see, why is it wilted? Could just be a clogged emitter. You can fix that in a few seconds. Use a vented heater only. Uh, by this, I mean you're, you're burning some type of hydrocarbon, natural gas, propane, uh, number two diesel, maybe wood. The exhaust gases have to be vented either through the roof or through an end wall. Get those exhaust gases out. 
heat stays in, the exhaust goes out. Um, don't use any space heaters in the greenhouse. Now in a high tunnel, which is not really tight, uh, in other words, it's a little leaky, you might occasionally need a space heater uh, to keep a crop from freezing, but that's a different story. You don't want to use space heaters like a salamander heater in a greenhouse as your normal heating system because all of the exhaust gases are blown into the greenhouse with the heat. You don't want that. There are some sales reps out there that sell what they call 100% efficient heaters. What's, what is a 100% efficient heater? It doesn't exist. It's, it's a selling point that is untrue. The only heaters that would be regarded as 100% efficient are electric heat. And you don't want to try to heat a whole greenhouse on electricity because it will cost way too much. So um, there are ventless heaters that are used in chicken houses. And the chickens are tolerant of these gases, but tomatoes are not. So if a sales rep tries to sell you uh, heater, chicken heaters, chicken house heaters, uh, find another sales rep because they don't know what they're talking about. Tomatoes are not chickens. Okay, I think that's clear. So ethylene and carbon monoxide in the exhaust gas will kill the flowers. So what happens if you lose flowers? You lose yield. Not good at all. So with excess carbon monoxide and ethylene, uh, they usually go together. Um, this, this is the kind of symptom you see on the leaves. So the leaves will twist. They will turn upside down. They will be sort of crinkled um, with a wavy edge. Um, let's try to look at that picture on the left and you have an idea. And worst of all, the flowers abort. They cannot tolerate uh, these kind of um, poisons in their system. So what ethylene levels are too high? Well, we have two different types of exposure. A chronic is a small amount over a long period of time. 0.01 to 0.05 parts per million. This is very small. That amount over long term will cause symptoms. Acute is when you have exposure during a short period of time, but it's a higher dose. So even three hours of exposure at one part per million ethylene will knock those flowers off the plants. So we don't want exhaust gases in the greenhouse. And furthermore, we want to make sure our ducts do not leak. Our uh, heating, our heater itself does not have pinholes in the firebox where it's leaking exhaust gases into the greenhouse environment. An estimated 15 to 20 percent of a heated greenhouse greenhouses have air pollution problems. So this is something to stay on top of and watch for symptoms. The first time you see symptoms, uh, you got to jump on this one and. Typically, the symptoms will be worse near the heater. So if you have these symptoms right near the heater and not the rest, uh, be very suspicious and get, get an expert out there to take a look. The heater problems are often either new heaters that have not been adjusted properly, so they have a clean burning blue flame, or old heaters that are starting to leak through um, degraded metal. Um, I would say on an average, if the heater is eight years old or more, um, start to start to uh, watch it closely and be suspicious of leaks. So common scenario with ethylene damage, and this happens every year. We have one or two of, of my growers every year in Mississippi. So scenario is the grower installed a new propane heater, unvented, probably because that sales rep told him he didn't need to vent it. But Maybe he just didn't know to vent it. So that goes up in the fall. Within a few days, the tomato leaves start to droop. But the weird thing about the drooping is they're not wilted. You know, a wilted leaf, you can feel it, and it's very soft, not uh, stiff. So these are still turgid. The root system is healthy. Flowers fall off. The upper leaves twist. That is a serious problem. Let's talk about humidity now. Dr. McAvoy touched on humidity. Perfect humidity for growth and pollination together is 70%. What does that mean to us? Well, it doesn't mean all that much if you can't adjust it, you know, one or 2% up and down. Or, I mean, our humidity 
in the south here is extremely high and it's always higher in the greenhouse. If I tell growers, um, set, your, set your humidity at 70%, I mean, they'll know that I'm crazy because they, they can't do that. In dry climates, you can raise the humidity easily with humidifiers and that's very helpful for them to get better pollination. So this is difficult to maintain in hot, humid climates and Connecticut is included in, in, the, in the hot, humid climates in your, in your summer, your, your brief summer, which is three months. Our summer is like six months. Transpiration. Um, plants naturally transpire water to keep them healthy and to cool the plant. And when they transpire, they carry uh, nutrients from the root system up into the leaves, stems, flowers, the fruit, et cetera. The transpiration um, means water is flowing out of the leaves into the environment. Um, it's easier for plants to transpire in low humidity or mid-level humidity. In high humidity, it's more difficult for transpiration to occur and transpiration is important. So high humidity and low air movement inhibit transpiration and the plants can get heat stressed which can affect plant health, all kinds of things. You get humidity from the transpiration from the plants and also from evaporation from any water surfaces in the greenhouse. Uh, wet plastic on the floor, puddles, um, wet fruit, wet leaves, condensation, it's all, um, it all adds to the humidity and too much humidity is bad. Too little humidity is bad too. So if, you're, if you go through the greenhouse and you see this, on your plastic and it's on the inside of the plastic surface, you have a problem. And if you see uh, moisture on the fruit so that they're dripping and the roof is, uh, it's raining in there, you know, the water drops on your head, uh, you have a serious problem. So if you don't have any horizontal airflow fans, the small fans that blow horizontally across the top of the greenhouse, add at least two and four is even better. So two on one side of the greenhouse, two on the other side, um, each pair blows in the same direction. So it's cyclical. You're making a circle of air movement through the greenhouse. Um, by the way, if you see this kind of um, condensation and it's between layers, like you have two layers of plastic in the greenhouse, look at your inflator fan, your squirrel cage blower. If your blower is drawing air from inside the greenhouse, you will get condensation between the layers. And you can't get that out unless you puncture the plastic and let it drain. So change your, your intake, your little uh, dryer tube, whatever size it is, it's like a dryer uh, vent tube, um, and draw the air from outside the greenhouse. The outside air is drier and you won't get this mess between the layers. If you go through the greenhouse and you see this, this is a leaf mold problem. That's the actual name of the disease. Um, this is from high humidity. So you want to try to avoid those problems. The problems with high humidity, summing them all up, too, hot, too high, you get lower yield, lower fruit quality, poor fruit set. When it's humid, pollen will stick together. It sort of clumps up and then that makes it heavy and it drops, it tends to fall instead of pollinating the flower. So that reduces your fertilization of the flowers. In low humidity, something you probably don't have a lot of problem with, the stigma may dry out so the pollen grains won't stick to it very well. That's more of an Arizona, New Mexico uh, problem, uh, Southern California problem. So if you see condensation, it's too humid. Controlling humidity helps with everything, fruit set quality and reduces diseases because the fungi need a moist surface to reproduce. How do you control the humidity? Exhaust fans move the plants and also help with high temperature and humidity. You're blowing that heat and, excuse me, moist air out of the greenhouse. On the other hand, The horizontal airflow fans, HAF, they stir the air, they mix it up, and they help dry the leaf surfaces, the flower surfaces, the fruit surfaces, and the inside of the plastic. So you need exhaust fans to cool 
you need horizontal airflow fans to dry. The HAF fans do not cool the greenhouse. They mix the air and move the air around. When is high humidity the worst? It's worse in the early mornings because um, it's cooler. So uh, there's more condensation. During the cooler months with limited use of exhaust fans is the worst time. So you, in, your, in your winter months, you go in the greenhouse first thing in the morning. That's when you're gonna see a lot of um, moisture. So if, if you're seeing that, in spite of using horizontal airflow fans and exhaust fans, Here's something you can do. Turn on the exhaust fans first thing in the morning for a few minutes. And you're saying, wait a minute, it's cold outside. I know it's cold outside. I grew up there. Okay, it's cold outside. So you turn them on for a few minutes and that drives out that moisture, that, that warm, moist air pretty quickly. And then turn the fans off. You don't have to keep them on that long. You'll, you'll feel the difference. That will cause the heater to come on if it's too cool. So you're blowing out the moisture. And then you're causing your heater to come on, which further dries the air. So just this five minute or so procedure will make a big difference in humidity control. Okay, so we talked about the environment and prevention, things you can do to prevent the problem. What else could go wrong? Well, there are a few things that could go wrong. So let's get right into it. This is probably the most common, and I, I'm sure all of you know, this is blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is a firm darkening of the bottom of the fruit, almost always on the blossom end or bottom of the fruit. It's not mushy. It doesn't smell bad like, like bacterial soft rot. It's a firm patch of brownish black leathery area. It's from lack of calcium in the fruit. And I specify in the fruit. I, I did some of this research on my master's degree. And you may have enough calcium in the leaves. Your tissue analysis might say adequate. But if it doesn't get to the fruit, you get this cell wall breakdown, which causes loss of med rot. So why isn't it getting to the fruit? If there's any kind of wilting going on, even the slight bit of wilting in the plant, the uh, calcium will not get translocated all the way to the fruit. It may make it to the leaves, it may not, but sometimes it's in the leaves, but not enough in the fruit. So avoid um, wilting. Anytime you think you have wilting, look at how much water, which is really nutrient solution, you're applying and increase it. If you're, if you, if you're applying enough, uh, your intervals may be too long. This has happened many times where somebody says, I'm putting on about two quarts of water a day. Well, how often? Uh, two hours apart. Might not be enough. When it's warm out, you might need it every hour. So increase the, um, the intervals. Um, let's see, nitrogen. You don't wanna over fertilize with nitrogen, especially ammonium nitrogen, because that can aggravate loss of men rot. Uh, avoid the, the dry plants, avoid wilting. You need young, actively growing root hairs at the end of the roots to take up the calcium. If uh, When they dry out, those root hairs dry up and stop functioning. Once they get enough water, the roots will grow new root hairs and start taking up calcium. And I put this in just to show you what can happen if a grower does not realize or forgets to add any calcium nitrate to the fertilizer program. This grower uh, forgot, he was new. He, he just, he had calcium nitrate in his fertilizer tank room, he just never opened the bag. So the terminals of the plants die, they turn black and stop growing. Also the tips of the roots turn black and die. So that means they can't take up any nutrients anymore. So th this is the end of the crop. Not very big, but that one was done. So blossom end rot, death of the terminals, top and bottom. How about this one? Well, you know, horticulture is a very technical field and we have very technical terms. So this is called, you ready? Cracking. This is called splitting. Now we'll talk about the difference, whoops. Cracking is deeper and it's dry. 
splitting is shallow and it's only skin deep. So it's often moist in there too. Both of these are, are terrible for the fruit. So radial cracking is when the cracks radiate from the top. The other kind is concentric cracking, which you see in home gardens quite a bit, where it cracks around the shoulders in circles. So avoid sharp changes in water. That means not enough water going to too much water. Not enough, too much. Not good. Um, avoid wilting. And uh, splitting is really bad because the, the shelf life on a moist split like that is terrible. These will, these will not last long at all. This one, we have some really ugly looking fruit. The general name for this is cat facing. It has nothing to do with cats. I don't know how it got that name. I've never seen a cat like this. If you have, let me know. So cat facing is irregular, uh, dimples, cracks, crevices on the bottom of the fruit. It's, most of the cause is cool temperature. So when do we see a lot of cracking? Well, in a home garden, we see this from our neighbors who planted uh, three weeks earlier than everybody else. And their first fruit will have lots of this um, cat facing. Well, as the temperature warms up, they won't see a lot of cat facing anymore. But meanwhile, they have some ugly looking fruit. Um, this will happen in the greenhouse too if you're not keeping your temperature up. You'll get more cat facing, which you can't sell. Some varieties will get it more than others. Um, if it's an area where you can cut off the good part, it still tastes fine. You can eat this. You will not catch this from your fruit. So it's okay to eat them. Leaf roll is when the leaves, especially the bottom leaves on the plant, roll up. Sometimes they completely roll up and form little tubes. Well, this one is typically starts at the bottom and will move up. It's not a disease. It's physiological. And it's very common with moist soils, high fertility, especially when temperatures are up. It looks bad, but doesn't affect yield doesn't affect fruit quality. But this is one you don't have to worry about. That's a good thing. Okay, here we have a cluster with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. 10. It had 10 flowers on it, but two of them set. So we have a problem here. Uh, first of all, that's a lot of flowers for one cluster and it's best to cluster prune down to four or even three. Based on your, your, your crop load, you want to you reduce the number of fruit so you get full-size fruit and not a bunch of little marbles. So what's wrong here? Blossom drop is the name of it. The flowers fall off, interferes with your high yields. If the temperatures are too high or too low, you can get blossom drop. So day temperature above 90, which can happen easily, or a night temperature under 75 will interfere, I mean above, sorry, night temperature above 75 will interfere with fruit set. That 75 is from some research at North Carolina State several years back. Night temperature above 64 is ideal for, for the, I'm talking about the winter months. Um, our growers raise tomatoes mostly fall, winter and spring, and they're out of business in June. Our summers are too ferocious. So also too much or too little nitrogen will can cause blossom drop, high humidity, ethylene, we discussed thoroughly. Uh, so any kind of stress will cause blossom drop and really hurt your yield. Why are these fruits so small? They're small. No, they're not cherry tomatoes. No, that's something somebody says every time I give a talk. Is it fertility? It could be. Is it water? It could be. If they're, if they're water stressed, if your nitrogen is way, way, way too high, is it poor pollination? In this case, yes, it is poor pollination. Slice transversely. What's that? Well, that's slicing across, not slicing through the, through the stem end, but slicing uh, from left to right, I think is the best way to say it. Take a look at these tomatoes. You see that sharp angle and you see how flat it is here. It's flat here. 
This area with the glare is flat. This area is sunken in. Okay, well, what I'm pointing out is that the locules or the chambers in the fruit are not filled up with seeds and gel, that gooey gel that forms around each seed. They're lacking the mucilaginous gel. So when you look in there, I'm on it. Why did my phone do that? Did I say Siri? Um, so um, slice transversely. And if you don't see a lot of seeds in those chambers or locules, there's a pollination problem. Sometimes there are locules with no seeds and of course, no gel. Those are flat or even uh, pressed in. Um, so angular flat-sided fruit is what you're looking for. And if you're not sure, go ahead and cut some across from left to right and see if those locules are empty. If you have poor pollination, it's time to get on it. Either you're not pollinating every other day, or if you have bees, those bees are dead. Time to get a new hive. Here we have some leaves with various types of yellowing, uh, and they're not exactly the same either. So we'll, we will discuss several possibilities here. Here we go. If the leaf yellowing is interveinal, meaning the veins are green, between the veins, yellow. That is intervenal chlorosis or intervenal yellowing. If it's on the upper leaves, like the top few inches of the plant, these small leaves, it's either iron deficiency or a manganese deficiency. And you, sh you should get a soil test. But one, uh, one thing you can keep in mind is iron deficiency starts at the base of the leaflets. So you'll see yellowing here and green here. Manganese, not magnesium, manganese deficiency starts at the tips. So you'll see yellowing here and it's still green here. As time progresses, you'll see the entire leaflet with interveinal yellowing, just like this one. If you catch, catch it early enough or try to find leaflets where they're not completely yellowed, um, you, you can pick it out, but verify it with tissue analysis. If the interveinal yellowing is on lower leaves or halfway up the plant, probably have magnesium deficiency. This is very, very common. And I see it mostly when the plants are setting the fourth or the fifth cluster on the plant. This gives you a timeline. If you have four or five clusters and you start to see yellowing about waist high, um, be very suspicious of magnesium deficiency. Verify it with a test, tissue analysis. And you can also spray with magnesium sulfate, better known as Epsom salt, to uh, rectify this. Two tablespoons per gallon, two tablespoons per gallon of Epsom salt. Dissolve, dissolve it very well. And if you spray that on a few plants, within a week, they should be almost entirely green. That's one way to check it on your own. How about if the yellowing is not intervenal? Um, if you have nitrogen, nitrogen deficiency, the plants have a general yellow cast to them, either light green or yellowish from top to bottom. If your older leaves are turning yellow and they're not diseased, uh, they're shaded. They're naturally shaded and the plant uh, the plant is killing them off. This is natural senescence. Um, and it's okay to remove those lower leaves when they're yellow because they're not contributing to the plant anymore at all. Then there are diseases and you have your pathologists at UConn and uh, I know some of you are from uh, New York State and NC State and Ohio and other places. You have your pathologists who can help you. And uh, also Tennessee, we have some viewers. So most often, uh, the most common one is either early blight or target spot. And both are very similar. They're both from alternaria. Um, first, you see small brown circles on the lower leaves. And if you look carefully, they have concentric rings in them, like a bullseye pattern. Then the brown circles get bigger. And then the lower leaves turn yellow. And then the lower leaves actually fall off the plant. They just drop. If you have yellow leaves falling off, you have early blight or target spot. And it doesn't stop there. 
the symptoms move up to the next leaf and the next one, the next one, I've seen greenhouses where there are just a few leaves left at the top of the plant because all the other leaves turned yellow and fell off because they, they didn't know what it was. Right. If you have this, you can get it under control. Best to control it when it's just on the bottom leaves. Now we go to the fruit symptoms, uneven ripening. You can get green stripes, streaks, blotches, green shoulders, a lot of different causes here. So it's up to the grower to narrow it down and eliminate the unlikely causes. High fertility, excess nitrogen, low potassium. Low potassium can also cause the internal color of the fruit to not be red. You can see green areas inside the fruit or a hard core, probably a potassium deficiency problem. High temperature, when those plants uh, in the greenhouse get uh, around 94 degrees, way too hot for tomatoes, uh, the pigment, which is lycopene, is killed. So when the red pigment is killed, what's under it? Well, there's plenty of green pigment in there. So that's what you're seeing. So if it's really hot, suspect um, lycopene death. There are viruses that can cause greening and silverleaf white flies can cause this too. Not, not the common greenhouse white fly, but the silverleaf or a sweet potato white fly. So maintain the correct fertilizer program and try to narrow down what the culprit is and, and fix it. Here we have some fruit with these fine cracks in the surface. This is not good. This is called russeting. And if you grow potatoes and you get russeting, you get to charge more money for them. If you grow pears and you have uh, russet pears, you get to charge more money for them. If you get this in your tomatoes, you get to throw them in the trash because russeting is terrible. Russeting causes uh, water loss from those cracks. So the shelf life uh, falls apart. They won't, they just won't keep. Um, it's believed to be due from moisture on the surface. So going back to that earlier slide, when you see droplets on the fruit in the mornings, that may cause some of this russeting. Also, um, it's common practice to top the plants six weeks before you, you plan on terminating the crop. So for example, if you, I'm just gonna throw out a date which may not coincide with your schedule, but in this area, if somebody's terminating the crop uh, middle of June, June 15th, you would top the plant around May 1st. So you'd cut off the top of the plant because there won't be any time to ripen another fruit cluster. So when you do that, you need to leave two leaves above the highest cluster and they help shade uh, the fruit so it doesn't sun scald. We we'll talk about that too. And it also gives leaf surface for transpiration to take effect. So um, the leaves will transpire so uh, the fruit don't uh, burst cells here. Sun scald. As I said, if we don't have good leaf cover on the top, you can get sun scald, which is just like sunburn. Your skin burns, tomatoes and peppers and other fruit, uh, fruiting vegetables get this scald. It's a white or tan blistery area. Um, it's not a disease, but if the, if the area splits open, cracks open from being so dry, um, it can be invaded by a pathogen and cause some type of fruit rot. So don't prune too heavily, leave two leaves at the top when topping. Okay, now we're into the wilts. And wilts can be from a disease, called biotic or from a living thing, or they can be abiotic, a non-living thing. And the wilt itself looks the same. There are no spots or lesions, just wilt. You can't tell the difference. But what you can do is look and see if you have a break. If you have a break in the stem, um, you can straighten it up and tape it. You can buy florist tape, or you can use masking tape. You can use duct tape. You can use any kind of tape. Um, and often the plant will heal. If you catch this like the day it happens or even the day after, a lot of times the top will recover and you won't lose that, that growing point. 
So you got to be on it. If it's not a break in the plant, um, look for a clogged emitter. The emitter's clogged. Uh, you can often pull it out and um, replace it with another one or uh, remove it so the sediment gets out of the line and blows out and then put it right back on and chances are it'll just work again once you clean it up. So if it's a disease, you need a pathologist to help you identify, is it tomato spotted wilt causing wilt? Is it fusarium wilt? Is it bacterial wilt? There are lots of possible diseases that can do this. Okay, this is an oddball one. This is edema. It starts with an O, but it's like the O is silent. Edema. Edema is like a blistering or bubbling on the surfaces of the leaves. Also, it can show up on the stems and it looks terrible. It looks like it's been invaded by something, but um, whoops, edema is from temperatures being too cold, especially when your humidity is up. And it really doesn't hurt the plant, although it looks terrible. But it's telling you the environment is not perfect. So if it's from the cold, you know how to fix that, right? Bump up your thermostat. Spray burn. Sometimes people get little spots on the fruit, on the stems, or on the leaves. And your lab will say, no disease found. Well, what happens is uh, somebody is using a sprayer, like a backpack sprayer, with the pressure cranked up pretty high. And that spray will actually abrade the surface, causing a wound. And it heals with a little scar. So all of these are spray burn. So beware of using pressures that are higher than recommended. Okay, now this is a real test of your skill. Um, this one looks like it could be a nutrient deficiency. It looks like it could be a disease. It looks like it could be a virus. It looks like it could be um, physiological. Uh, actually, it's not. And I know some of you know what this is. This is Roundup damage, glyphosate. So should Roundup be used in the greenhouse? No way. Tomatoes are extremely sensitive. Roundup shouldn't be used in the garden, shouldn't be used in a high tunnel, shouldn't be used in the greenhouse, shouldn't be used in a commercial field. You can use Roundup outside when there's nothing growing in that field. Okay, fallow field, use Roundup, but not when there are tomatoes in the field or in the garden. So, um, Roundup will show up, Roundup damage will show up in the newest growth. So that's at the top of the plant, and that's in the axillary shoots. The little side shoots will turn yellow. But the other leaves, older leaves, will stay a nice, healthy looking green. So if you get this, um, it, you know, if it's just a light touch, sometimes the plants will grow out of it. But if it's severe like this and your, your growing tips die, uh, those plants are done. So word of advice, not only keep the Roundup from being inside the greenhouse, but do not spray Roundup around the outside perimeter when there's a crop in the greenhouse. I've seen it several times where the Roundup damage is inside the greenhouse along the sidewalls, even though it was sprayed outside. So uh, word of caution, no Roundup anywhere near the tomato plants. And I throw these in just sort of for fun. Like if you need a system for keeping your pests alive, your, your neighbor says, hey, I have some house plants and I, I'm, I normally keep them outside, but in the winter, uh, we don't have room in our house. How about if I just stick them in a corner of your greenhouse? That's fine, isn't it? No, that's a no, no way, no how. Because those um, white flies and mealy bugs and leaf miners, everything that's on those will see tomatoes and they taste so much better. But no, and this is one possible way to wire your greenhouse. I don't have any diagrams with me, so you're gonna to have to take notes on this and wire your own greenhouse, but something like that will be just fine. Diagnostics resources, you have them, you have agents, you have very skilled agents and specialists, you have digital diagnostics, you have a lab, there are email groups, you have friends in the business, and don't hesitate to use them. Uh, as soon as you find something irregular, 
going on in the greenhouse, um, get some help. Take some pictures, email them around. Um, have a friend of yours in the business who's maybe who's been doing it longer. Um, communicate and maybe get some good answers quickly. Uh, these, this list I showed before, these two highlighted ones are the ones I'd recommend for this talk. Tomato troubles, common problems with tomatoes. Excuse me, and environmental control for greenhouse tomatoes. All on the website, free downloads. There's the tomato troubles. We talk about the lost men rock cracks and the misshapen fruit and lots of other things in there with some good pictures. And finally, the greenhouse tomato fact, worry. I mentioned this before, make sure you worry about your crop, check everything, uh, check your EC and pH, use that extra gallon jug to check the volume per day. So you're not letting your plants dry out. Take a walk in the greenhouse every day, at least once a day, walk through, see if you have a wilted plant, see if there's some white flies that weren't there before, um, anything irregular. Often white flies will start on one or two plants. And if you catch them, you can spray those, those couple of plants and then the few right around them and wipe out that population. Whereas if you wait a week, they will be everywhere in the greenhouse. So we call that a hot spot. So look, look for the hot spot uh, for white flies. Um, they'll come in and they'll populate a few plants very quickly. One more. Anything wrong with these tomatoes? Um, I usually don't get any hands going up and that's because there's nothing wrong with these. So learn to recognize the good tomatoes, learn to recognize the defects and the cold tomatoes.